On a warm and sunny day in 2011, I stood in a crowd of a million people in central Lond London for the royal wedding of Prince William and Kate Middleton. Conducting interviews with those around me, I was struck by their great joy and optimism about the future. Not just the future of William and Kate, but their own future as well. Several people talked about how the fact that Kate Middleton is a commoner meant that anyone could marry a prince. As one woman in the crowd told me, this girl is becoming a princess today, and, and that's part of the excitement. I wonder what she thought this morning when she got up and shaved her legs, like, oh, I'm becoming a princess. She went on, Kate Middleton grew up normal, like us. Everyone dreams of marrying a prince. We all dream about it. Like this woman, I too grew up on stories of true love and happily ever after. I would watch Disney, Cinderella, and Snow White as if they were instruction manuals on how to, <laughs> yeah, on how to go from being poor and downtrodden to that white castle in the sky. When I was young, I was certain that I too would ride off into the sunset with someone who would lead me into a better, more secure future. <sighs> but I hate to tell you, by the time of the royal wedding, I no longer believed that love would save me. When it comes to romance, my heart long ago turned to stone. But wait, <laughs> I got this way not from love gone wrong. In fact, I have the best partner on earth. I got this way because of what I do for a living. You see, I'm a professor and I've been teaching a course on the sociology of heterosexuality for two decades now. I'm also writing this book about romance, and it's taken me everywhere from the royal wedding to vampire tourism in Italy, uh, <laughs> I, um, to, to interviewing over 100 young people in, in North America who are planning their own weddings. And teaching and writing about romance for all these years has taught me a few things. The first thing I learned about romance is that it's thoroughly modern. It's not that there weren't earlier ideas of romance, uh, like Guinevere, Guinevere and Lancelot, or Romeo and Juliet. But if you think about it, these romantic stories did not occur in marriage. It was about a knight and his lady, but she was married to her lord. Or it was about stories about going against your family's wishes, like Romeo and Juliet. In any case, let's just say these pre-modern love stories generally didn't end well. Our contemporary notion of romantic love that we will find our better future when we see our one true love across a crowded room, that we will feel butterflies in our stomach, that when we kiss, fireworks will go off behind us, and then we will get married and live with that person happily ever after. That's such a thoroughly modern idea that you can't even find it before the 1800s. I would actually date the start of modern romance somewhere around 1850, when uh, probably about the time that this woman, Esther Halland, started making Valentine's Day cards in Worcester, Massachusetts. Although never married herself. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Hallen's Valentine's Day cards represent the most important thing we need to know about romantic love. It was born alongside capitalism. Capitalism commodified our authentic human emotions into something we could buy. Ever since Ms. Hallen started her business, capitalism and romance have been in bed together. <laughs> the story of capitalism, then, has always been a love story. Capitalism sells us an ideology, romance, that makes us ignore material reality in favor of fantasy. Yet most people who've studied capitalism haven't paid much attention to romance. Karl Marx, thought that capitalism happened because the modes of production changed. Max Weber thought that capitalism happened because of Protestantism and this radical idea that God might actually want us to make a profit. But the truth is, capitalism wouldn't have had a chance had it not been for romance. Capitalism and romance work together like a well-oiled machine. This machine, let's call it Love, Inc., convinces us to work hard now for some future payoff. 
But the payoff we learn to want is not necessarily more money and more material goods, but meeting our one true love and living happily ever after. We just have to buy the right toothpaste, the right clothing, the right engagement ring, the right wedding dress, or even watch the right TED talk to make that future happen. <laughs> so the second thing I learned about modern romance is it's not natural. Yeah. Cole Porter told us that birds do it, bees do it, even educated fleas do it. But I doubt it. We have to learn to believe that romantic love is our path to happiness, just like we have to learn to believe in one God over another. No one is born wanting a white wedding dress. Average cost, about $1,300. A diamond ring, about $5,600. Or gifts and cards on Valentine's Day. Annual amounts spent in the United States, $17.6 billion. We have to be taught to want these things. We learn how to fall in love from each other and from our culture, from movies, love songs, romance novels. We even learn how to fall in love from our governments in the form of laws like who gets to be married and who doesn't and what rights and privileges go along with that. And of course, we learn to be believe in romance because we exist in an economy that depends on romance to sell us stuff. Now, this leads me to the third thing I've learned about romance. It's difficult to take a look at the ideological work it's doing because it hides behind a smokescreen of claiming that romantic love is natural, that love is all we need, and anyone can fall in love. Romance has propaganda like any other ideology, little slogans that we say to each other like, love is blind, that trick us into feeling optimistic about our futures so we don't pay much attention to things like the distribution of wealth or the environment. <laughs> Yet love is not blind. When we look at marriage in the US, we see that people almost never marry outside their class and rarely marry outside their race. In the US today, marriage has primarily become a sign of distinction, a status symbol, like wearing a Rolex watch. But it's also an optional one that's primarily for college-educated uh, people who are also whiter and wealthier than the population. A minority of adult Americans are married, and even fewer people are married in Europe. Not only that, but white weddings are costing more now than ever. The average cost of the wedding a wedding in the U.S. has been rising despite the ongoing economic recession and is now $30,000. You can double or even triple that in big cities like New York, New York, where the average wedding is now $86,000. To put that into perspective, the median household income in the U.S. is about $52,000, and for a black family, it's about $38,000. Even if you find your one true love and you have that perfect wedding, romantic love rarely leads to the happily ever after of the ideal family. In the US, since the end of World War II, there was this dream of getting married, buying a house in the suburbs, having 2.3 kids and a white picket fence. The US government even subsidized this dream with zero interest housing loans for returning, uh, returning soldiers. But this nuclear family was always more of a shimmering mirage than a lived reality. The, the nuclear family, what some conservative commentators mistakenly refer to as the traditional family, was really a product of the nuclear age. At its height, only about 40% of Americans lived in a family with two parents and kids. Today, fewer than 20% do. By selling us an ideal that almost none of us will have, romance managed to make us keep looking keep looking for that happy ending, if only we found the right partner, or the right house, or the right picket fence. Not only is love not blind, but it's hardly all we need. In the US, 45.3 million people live in poverty, and about one in five children do. We all need adequate food, shelter, and water. We also need meaningful work and livable wages. We need to combat global climate change with all our energies. We need racial and gender justice. We need peace. Even if we find our own, own happily ever after, we still may not survive the future. But because we come to believe that romance is what gets us to a better future, we spend an inordinate amount of time and resources on coupling and very little on the challenges we actually face. 
This brings me to the fourth thing I've learned about romance. It might actually destroy our future. Even though romance makes us feel optimistic about tomorrow, it's also taking us down this dead end of private lives when what we need most are community and global solutions. Now, how did this happen? How do we stop believing in a common future and become obsessed with our own private happy endings? I think it happened because a new form of capitalism, often referred to as neoliberalism, came along and it privatized everything, from education to healthcare to our futures. In the US, this new form of capitalism began with this man, Ronald Reagan. As Reaganomics took hold, so did romance. Perhaps it's not a coincidence that seven months after Reagan took office, Charles, Prince of Wales, married Lady Diana Spencer in the most fairy tale of weddings. 750 million people watched it around the world. One BBC commentator described the event as a fairy tale fantasy. It's like something out of Walt Disney. Speaking of Disney, the corporation was not doing very well in the 1980s, but it managed to turn itself around by reinvigorating romance as a genre of choice. After really poor sales with non-romantic films like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids or Oliver and Company, Disney went back to its romantic roots. And in 1989, it hit the jackpot with The Little Mermaid and Pretty Woman. Both of these movies, which I'm sure you've seen, convince us that love is blind and that even if we have to completely abandon our families and communities, love will lead to a better future. <laughs> these movies sent Disney profits up 35% and nearly 57% on the sale of video cassettes. And if you don't know what those are, you'll have to look it up. <laughs> After several decades of Reagan-style economic policies in the US, the top 10% now account for 80% of the wealth, and the top 1% account for 47% of income. Recently, an economist who studies the global concentration of wealth pointed out that this level of income inequality is not only detrimental to economic growth, it can also, quote, lead to a capture of the political process by a tiny high income and high wealth elite. This is an outcome that already seems to have happened in US politics. And this redistribution of wealth happened because romance seduces us into privatizing our futures. Instead of imagining that we are all in this together if we want a happy ending, we imagine that we can enter a better world by virtue of falling in love. It's not that there was a conspiracy of global capitalism and romance, it's just that romance could do the, the emotional labor for this new type of capitalism. And so we clung to it the way the princess clings to her prince when the evil witch is about to destroy the world. Love is worth taking a closer look at precisely because it is neither natural nor universal. Romance teaches us not to deal in reality, but fantasies. Money, divorce, decreasing happiness are not to be acknowledged. Global climate change, a worldwide redistribution of wealth in the hands of the few at the cost of the ma ma many can be ignored as we increasingly spend our time and energy searching for the perfect romance. Romance promises that anyone, rich or poor, black or white, straight or gay, can reap its rewards. You can be old and have failed at romance over and over and over again, but just keep trying. Your prince or princess is out there. You can be poor and have no way out of poverty, but still imagine that one day you might marry a prince. Heaven in the form of a fairy tale ending is just around the corner if you just follow the rules. Show yourself to be a good romantic citizen. Buy the right stuff. No wonder so many of us feel disenchantment, but also no wonder so many of us feel the purpose and hope that is at the heart of romance. This is where the marriage of romance and capitalism draws its strength. We are, being sold in increasing, we are being sold hope in increasingly hopeless times, and we're buying it like never before. Which brings me to the fifth and final thing I've learned about romance. It's not all there is. We do not need Love, Inc. We can feel hopeful and connected to others by working together to face the future as communities, not as couples. 
If we want a better future, we are going to have to move beyond our own private happily ever after. We're going to have to spend our resources and our emotional energy on that communal future and stop getting caught up in Love, Inc. I realize that this is hardly a love story I've told you, but I hope it will leave you with the deeply romantic belief that the future can be better than the present. Thank you. Thank you.